Hello again, and welcome back to the latest session of the Going for Growth Conference. Now, this is obviously a conference organised by the Centre for Policy Studies, the, the best think tank. I, I don't think anyone here would argue with that. Um, but it turns out there are other people who have other opinions about what we should do with the economy. And we wanted to, uh, in this session, get a, a diverse range of views from some of the uh, heads of the other um, leading think tanks in the country. And just sort of argue the thoughts about, you know, Everyone agrees that growth is great and that we need more growth, but you know, obviously there are many, many routes to that and many different uh, different priorities. So I'm delighted to be joined by the heads of, uh, as I said, th three of the leading other think tanks in, in the country, Mark Littlewood, Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs, Will Tano of Onward, and Polly McKenzie of Demos. And, um, uh, and in fact, that's the order that they're, they're, going, to, uh, they're going to speak in. Um, so, uh, as before, as ever, um, if you have any questions, please do submit them via the CPS Think Tank uh, Twitter address, uh, via YouTube. We're also broadcasting on Facebook and on our website. And uh, in all known languages and galaxies, um, I'm reassured by our tech team. But um, this, we, we've, we've kept it down to, to four people so that we can have a, a lively discussion, and um, uh, which will hopefully uh, cover pretty much um, every aspect of, of the growth agenda. So, um, Mark, uh, can I? ask you to start with your vision for growth. Sure, uh, Rob, thanks. Good to be with you. I don't know whether the CPS is the best think tank, but the IEA is clearly the, the oldest and no doubt the wisest think tank uh, represented here. I'm very grateful for the uh, invitation. Let me just rattle through, through a few thoughts. Um, Rob, you said at the outset, and I'm, I'm sure it's right of, um, of the panelists uh, joining for this session, and probably for those watching on YouTube, that everybody agrees growth is basically good, important and matters. That's probably true of this cohort. I'm not so sure, however, it has been true overall in our public debate. Um, if you were to look at, I think the environmentalist movement is, uh, is specifically an anti-growth movement. Uh, it's, I don't think Extinction Rebellion are particularly concerned about whether our growth rate is 3% or 0% and quite probably prefer it to be 0%. So I think this is actually a contentious point, not one that uh, any longer commands universal support across the spectrum. And I just want to rattle through, if you like, why I think uh, those of sound mind need to uh, reiterate why it matters um, and what we should do about it. Um, and why does it matter is, although GDP is not the, the absolutely optimal measurement for how well the human race is doing, uh, there are all sorts of problems with it. Uh, I don't think it is the only thing in the world that we should care about, whether our GDP is going up uh, more or less. But it's pretty close to being the ace of trumps in the deck. It's probably the thing that we should care about the most, even if there are other considerations. It's not necessarily an ace that we would always play. And um, I think there are interesting questions about how you trade off if your growth is uh, um, temporary because it's based on let's say debt or whether it's damaging the environment or whether you want to trade off growth for things like social cohesion and poverty relief. I think all of those are uh, reasonable um, suggestions. Why does it matter that, and I just very quickly did a little bit of compound maths before joining you, uh, let's imagine um, over the next 20 years uh, four different long-term growth rates for the United Kingdom, very simply 1%, 2%, 3% and 4%. Um, and uh, let's imagine also, I think approximately the average wage is about £25,000 a year. Let's assume that the growth applies equally to all wage earners. If you're in the 1% band, roughly where the UK has been, I think we've probably got a long term growth rate of a little higher than that, but not much. You'll see average wages in today's money hit 30,000, just over 30,000 in 20 years time. If you're a little more ambitious and could get that to 2%, you'll see the average salary go up to about 37,000. If you're more ambitious still and think that the West should be returning to 3% average growth rates, then in 20 years time, the average wage would be about 45,000. And if you're super optimistic and have a magic recipe for more growth, the average wage would be 54,000. Quite, uh, quite a band of different outcomes over a single generation, simply based on whether your growth rate is 1% or 4%. And in addition to my concerns about the environmental movement thinking growth is bad. I think there's a danger also that um, politicians treat um, growth as being a kind of exogenous feature, an act of God, whether the British economy is growing at 1% or 2%. And look, to some degree, acts of God or acts of other jurisdictions matter. Uh, clearly, COVID-19 was not uh, invented in Britain and has had a big impact on growth. But it's not a wholly exogenous fact 
and I think that there are some substantial steps that we should take to positively encourage it so we can get average prosperity in the UK up to those sort of levels I've suggested. And I think you're going to be unsurprised at the two key um, propositions I've got. Uh, the first is regulation. Um, I think that we have allowed regulation to hamper productivity. In my view, it is the biggest single answer to the productivity puzzle that we have so much and so heavy regulation. And we always tend to bring in more without repealing stuff that may be useless or out of date. And in essence, we are therefore in danger of creating an economy in which we are spending, well, I was going to say all our time, not all of our time, but a very high proportion of our time complying rather than producing. And if you spend a large proportion of your time complying rather than producing, you can expect GDP growth to be sluggish. So on, um, uh, once we're finally out of the European Union, I hope that there is a coordinated attempt to look at what's on the regulatory statute books and what is hampering growth and very good reasons being need needed to be given for any of those regulations that we wish to maintain and retain. And I'm not suggesting we burn the whole lot. I'm just suggesting we cross-examine the whole lot. And uh, it seems nearly impossible to get the government uh, of any stripe to engage in a bonfire of red tape, which prevents uh, business growth and entrepreneurship in a large number of areas. I hope we get that. I hope Brexit's a trigger for that, and I think it could be. So plan A would be remove regulations which are uh, uh, extremely unhelpful to growth and questionable impact in other areas. Uh, plan B is on is on taxation. Uh, I think the overall burden of tax is too high at about 38% of national income there or thereabouts. Government spending is too high. Uh, uh, probably this year because of the lockdown and the pandemic will come in. Not very many points um, south of 50% of national income. And I think the, the, the economic literature on this is relatively clear. It's a social science, not an exact science. Uh, if you want the fastest rate of growth you can possibly manage, that tends to be correlated with a state sector that amounts to around about 20% of GDP. That's not the only thing that affects growth. If you've got a state sector spending 20% of GDP, but a very heavily regulated private sector, you might not get maximum growth. You can probably afford to have a larger government uh, expenditure, a bit like Scandinavia, if you don't have such a firm regulatory state. But very rule of thumbish, if you want to maximise economic growth, 20% is probably the goodish number to be looking at. If you want to maximise immediate welfare, so you're not devil take the hindmost and you want to make sure that you're happy to trade off a little bit of economic growth to, for example, make sure that you have a welfare programme that can combat poverty and uh, you know, nobody's dying or starving on the streets, you're probably looking at around about 30% GDP in the, in the state sector. And we're presently raising about 38% and spending about 45%. So my two public policy re recipes would be a long look at regulation. I know somebody will say, well, point to the ones, what are the ones that are really harming us? And I don't think there's any single regulation you can remove that would suddenly add 2% to growth. There's a million regulations that have a very minimal impact on growth. And I'm rather taken by pebble theory that regulating an economy is a bit like throwing pebbles into the River Thames. No single pebble will stop the flow of the River Thames. But if you stand by on the bank of the River Thames throwing pebbles in long enough, before uh, many years are out, you stem the tide. And so uh, a hard look at regulation post-Brexit and an honest discussion about our long-term tax take position. Uh, I'm not um, appalled that, that uh, the state sector grows in the context of a national crisis like coronavirus, but we, have, we are in danger of the government living beyond our means a little bit in uh, the good times and living beyond our means a lot in the bad times. And that is uh, not a sustainable long-term picture for the finances and I think is leading to a state sector that's too large. So I hope this zero-based spending review is going to be a meaningful one. And my third point, which I'll finish on, Rob, because I know you only want to speak for a few minutes in these opening remarks, isn't so much a, a policy, it's more of a strategy. And it goes to my point about, I think there's a danger that too many people in government and in politics think that uh, growth is largely exogenous rather than uh, in considerable, to a considerable degree, a result of domestic policy. I would like the government to adopt uh, growth as its principal objective, uh, as its principal strategy and to tell each sort of ministerial department any proposal uh, or change in the law or bill that you come up with will be tested against what it does for economic growth. 
Uh, the more you can show that it will be a growth booster, the more likely we're going to fast track it. If you've got any suggestion that it's actually going to knock 0.1%, 0.3%, 0.5% off GDP for some other uh, objective, we're going to cross-examine you on that very, very long and hard. So I'd like to see, quite apart from my two suggestions, which are around tax and regulation, it actually being a stated government policy to make growth its number one objective and to hold ministers and departments to account against that metric in a far stronger, far uh, clearer way than we do at the moment. That, that's why it matters and that's what I do about it. Brilliant. Well, um, Will, uh, your, your, your own views. Uh, uh, yeah, so a, bon, a, bon, a, bon, a bonfire of red tape and an end to throwing pebbles. Thank you very much, uh, Rob, for having me and uh, being in the room with um, the self-professed best think tank uh, in Westminster and uh, the IEA, the oldest think tank uh, in Westminster. Uh, it's nice to be the kind of uh, the bright young thing showing um, showing the oldies uh, how to do it. Um, uh, so I wanted to focus, I mean, I knew that I expected Mark to focus on uh, tax and regulation, um, because that's what the IEA has historically um, done lots of work on. I wanted to focus on a few issues where um, I feel like uh, there hasn't been enough economic debate, especially on the centre right, and where we do know that there are kind of long term structural issues with the UK economy that we have just so far failed to resolve over many decades. And I think especially at a time right now where we do definitely need to grow the pie, we should be um, concentrating incredibly hard on growing the economy. I'm certainly not someone who, who thinks that, um, uh, that growth doesn't matter and a kind of, a, a, a kind of uh, a degrowth or, or, or no growther, um, as there are, uh, as we said, Rob. Um, I think we, I think we should be concentrating quite hard on what type of growth we want and uh, focusing on some of the political realities that have emerged from from our economy over the last few years. So, um, for me, there are, I think, three big structural weaknesses in the economy where um, policymakers have not made the inroads that they. Uh, they should have done uh, in recent decades and we need to concentrate on right now and these weaknesses are weaknesses which not only hold back growth but they hold back living standards and uh, in, in doing so they also hold back our ability to fund uh, the increasing costs of public services which are likely to grow significantly in the next few decades. Um, so the first one that I would pick is the UK's relatively low rates of fixed investment in machinery and human capital, uh, which means we have just much less productive workers than comparable countries around the world. Fixed uh, investment in the UK is lower uh, than in every other OECD, OECD country and has been in every year but one since the 1960s. Um, British firms uh, installed about half as many uh, industrial robots as France last year, uh, about a tenth as much as Germany, and far, far, far less than, than countries like, like Singapore and others. Um, and as a result, we do simply have much lower rates of productivity than those countries. Um, uh, we're sixth in the G7 behind only uh, Italy, and that's only due to a recent revision in the statistics. Um, uh, and as we know, productivity growth in the UK for the last decade has been about 10 times lower than the average for the past preceding decade, about 0.2% compared to 2.5%. So I think uh, the problem of fixed investment is something that we need to pay much greater attention to. Um, the second point is something that is kind of growing in terms of political attention, but historically, certainly the Conservative Party and, and the centre-right hasn't focused on a huge amount and that's the the geographic balance of growth. Um, the UK has the most uh, geographically imbalanced economy in the industrialized world um, and we know that that has a material effect on overall growth rates for the entire country. Um, we know that more balanced uh, countries grow faster um, and uh, if you look across uh, the, uh, the kind of if you look across the world across large countries of the world G20 countries um, uh, there are no countries that are more geographically Im imbalanced than the UK, but have a higher share of GDP per head. So um, there is a, a kind of direct correlation between um, our, our regional imbalance and uh, the rates the rates of growth. And if you look at 
and what's happened over the last kind of 15, 20 years, we see that that is getting worse. So in 2004, to give you one example, London's economy was about the same size as the whole of the north of England. Uh, if you fast forward uh, to today, London's economy is about 25% bigger than the north of England. That's the equivalent of adding Edinburgh, Swansea, Belfast, Bristol and Birmingham to the size of the capital um, in relative terms uh, in the space of 15 years. So, so that problem of regional imbalance is getting worse and thus the drag on growth from regional imbalance is rising. And then the third issue, um, which I think we, we need to take incredibly seriously, not least because of the stock as well as the flow, is um, the UK's long tail of low skills, um, which we've heard policymakers of every colour and stripe uh, talk about for decades, but we have uh, continually failed to properly address. Um, so if you look at the UK uh, labour market today, about 30% of the working age population uh, is termed low skills, and about half of those, 4.2 million people, um, hold qualifications below level two, so that's the equivalent of a D at GCSE. Um, so, uh, so the UK just has uh, an incredibly uh, weak uh, kind of skills mix, um, and uh, we're unique among developed economies in the sense that our 18 to 24 year olds, uh, so younger generations, have worked skills overall, a higher share of low skilled, uh, low skilled people than 55 to 64 year olds. So in terms of kind of cohort effects, other countries are likely to, to kind of increase their skills mix over the next few decades. Um, if, if that pattern continues, the UK skills mix is likely to worsen. We are doing worse for this generation of young people than we were for uh, previous generations in terms of their skills development. Um, and we know that that has a very uh, significant effect on levels of growth and productivity. Um, people with higher levels of skills are more able to produce uh, higher value goods and services uh, in shorter spaces of time. They're also much more likely to weather the technological and economic storm that's uh, that's that's happening through both globalization and digitization. Um, uh, so we know that the, essentially, if a worker has a degree, they um, have significantly lower chance of, of automation than someone who doesn't. Despite everything we hear about about white collar workers being subject to automation, uh, too. Um, and if you look at some of the reasons why that skills development has been particularly weak, um, a big part of it is declining employer investment in the skills of their workforce. Um, so uh, we estimated a few years ago that uh, real terms employer spending on training is about £500 lower than it was in 2011 um, in real terms. That's, uh, that's a significant drop um, uh, over a relatively short period. So those are the three things that I think policymakers should focus on as we as we think about returning to growth and and digging ourselves out of the uh, of the kind of unprecedented economic hole that we find ourselves in. Um, I think we need to do much much more to encourage capital investment uh, in uh, both human capital and and, and fixed capital uh, machinery technology, the type of things which are going to boost our productivity both in the short term and materially in the long term. Uh, I think we need to radically improve. Uh, the kind of the regional balance of our economy and I would point to things like improving regional governance uh, uh, in kind of uh, thinking about taxes and, and thresholds which have a different uh, regional balance to the ones that we have focused on previously uh, and we need to invest seriously in the skills of the UK labour market because um, without that without without uh, highly skilled workers we are going to be left behind uh, in terms of uh, global competition over the next few decades. Thank you. An optimistic uh, take from uh, from Will there, <laughs> but also an extremely powerful one. Um, and uh, now Polly. Uh, hello, um, I'm really glad to go last because it means that I can say that Mark and Will and Rob have all said lots of really sensible things about how we grow the economy. Um, I want to start by saying something quite simple and obvious about what growth is, in that it's activity of some sort that creates value that we can measure um, and this will be relevant later but it's worth remembering that if i clean my house that's not growth if i pay somebody else to clean my house it counts as growth um well i mean not growth but economic activity that's within gdp that we can then measure um and it's I think really important for us to observe that lots of the activity that brings value and joy to our lives and to our economy is in fact not counted within GDP. 
Nevertheless, there's a, there's a good reason for that. One is that if I clean my own house, I might be creating value. Cleanliness, I might be preventing a COVID infection, who knows? But I'm creating value that is not monetizable and easily transferred or taxed by the government in order for the government to take some of that money and do something else useful with it. So because it's not monetized and to, or, or financialized, which is something that um, apparently is a bad thing, um, it, it, there's a reason why it's kind of left alone by the government and not worried about. Um, nevertheless, I think it's going to be important. It's important later in my argument. So um, nevertheless, most like growth is activity, increase in activity that or the value created by activity. And that can happen broadly in two ways. One is, as Will was talking about very compellingly, increases in productivity, the amount of value that is created in an hour or a minute of that activity. But the other thing that we can do to create growth is have more people doing the activities. Um, and actually through most of the labor era, a huge amount of our growth happened because more people were coming in into the economy. More people were shifting from doing activity that didn't count, some of which was really valuable, like cleaning their houses, and some of which was less valuable, like, I don't know, sitting in the park. Um, they were moving into the economy. And that included three groups of people in particular. One, women. Huge numbers of women moved into the economy over the last 30 or 40 years. We are basically at peak women in the economy throughout the whole of our history. Immigrants, of course, especially during the Labour era when we had the accession countries from Europe, huge numbers of people came into the country and got counted within our GDP who wouldn't otherwise. And a lot of growth came from that. It didn't obviously yield GDP per capita growth in the same way as productivity gains do. Nevertheless, uh, a lot of growth, a lot of tax revenue came from that. And the third was another group of older people. It hasn't been as transformative as the shift of women into paid uh, paid activity. But nevertheless, because of changes in pensionable age and also just changes in uh, the way people choose to live their lives, more older people are staying in the workplace longer, especially women. So older women kind of, if you think about the Venn diagram are included in, in those groups. So we are in a situation where if we want to create more growth, I, I basically agree with a lot of what Will said about how we can drive productivity, improving low skilled workers ability to be more productive by giving them more skills, investing in infrastructure so that people can be more productive during their time of work, investing in the fixed asset base so that all of that improves productivity. And that is fantastic. And there's lots of really great writing about productivity. I think there's a problem though, if we don't also find ways to bring more uh, people into the parts of activity in our society which we count for GDP. Um, and that's not to say that those parts of activity which don't count for GDP, like caring, don't matter or don't bring importance to our lives. They absolutely do. Nevertheless, if, if you have, this is my kind of um, feminist view, you may disagree with it, but if you have a situation in which all of the unpaid activity is done by one gender and all of the paid activity is done by the other gender, that creates a power imbalance. I would much prefer to see a shift so that the paid work and the unpaid work is more equally divided between those of uh, both genders or all genders, whichever way you prefer to see it. We have decided as a nation that the flow of migrants to grow our economy ought to reduce or stop uh, perhaps not stop but reduce certainly um whilst we don't formally have the target around uh, reducing net migration to the tens of thousands nevertheless the broad rhetoric of government is that we should be less reliant on migrant labor for low skilled economy for the low skill parts of our of our labor market in particular and that means we've decided that growing our economy by just having more people in it doing more activity is kind of off the off the table we've hit quite a, a difficult ceiling in terms of female labor market participation. Um, the government's done good work on childcare investment, but we've seen through the coronavirus pandemic that actually it, more traditional patterns of split between female and labor and female and male um, domestic roles at home have been reinforced. Um, 
and, and women continue to take on a very substantial majority of uh, of the unpaid domestic uh, tasks, including um, uh, cleaning. Um, and it feels uncomfortable for uh, for liberals, for for conservatives as well, I think, to try and sort of get involved in who's doing what inside the family home. I completely understand why people are skeptical that sort of micromanaging individuals' life choices in that way feels just kind of icky. Nevertheless, there are a whole range of different policy outcomes and we could explore them, but I think we have to accept that the goal of supporting and enabling more women to transfer tasks from that unpaid to the paid part of our economy is going to be important if we want to see growth and the tax revenues that may then come from growth. And the third group is older people. We usually hear about older people as a problem. And during coronavirus, we have heard you know, more and more calls that basically sort of be locked up systematically as a species. Um, I think we should think about older people much less as a problem and much more as an opportunity. We've seen quite how much of our hospitality uh, and our kind of town centre economy is reliant on older people who've got time and who've got money to spend. We should be doing much, much more to enable people to stay in the workforce for longer. And that's the area in which I'm most inclined to agree with Mark around taxes, um, uh, whether it's income taxes or, you know, for um, for people with you know part-time earnings or making sure that people it's still worthwhile staying in the economy and also we need to think about older people as as entrepreneurs we know there's a huge gap in female and male entrepreneurship um and one of the reasons is that women partly because they're more likely though of course there's plenty of examples of of women who who don't follow this pattern women are just more likely to have uh domestic responsibilities at home that lead them because they've got kids to be more risk averse around putting, for example, their home at risk. But actually, I think empty nester women are an extraordinary resource when it comes to risk appetite because they've suddenly got an amount of freedom um, and an age profile. We need to stop thinking about people who are 50 or 60 as being, oh, just on the pipeline to being a problem because we've got to look after them in a care home and start to think about that generation with experience um, and potentially, you know, half a lifetime of earnings behind them and risk appetite because you know potentially they're at that empty nest stage so men and women but especially women because the entrepreneurship is so low there as a source of innovation and potentially productivity growth so all of those things older people women uh migration i think we need to put those back into the mix and it might feel sometimes like social engineering and i commend those who feel uncomfortable about that but if we want growth we need to think about how we get those people to participate in the paid part of our economy because that's the pathway to growth. Thank you Polly and um, just to, to sort of structure the, the discussion a bit so as, as ever please please do send through some uh, some questions and I'll, I'll put them to the panel but I, but I wanted to sort of just throw out a, a few things to for us to to, to think about. Um, so uh, the first is that there is a tension between short-term and, and long-term growth. Um, uh, the, the challenges that we face. So, um, the, the in the last decade, it has been the, the, the most consistent. I mean, as, assuming, let's say, for the sake of argument, that um, GDP growth is a good thing and that we want more of it. Um, I, you know, um, that in the last decade, our GDP performance has been the most consistent it's been since the Second World War. Unfortunately, it's been consistently bad. Um, GDP has not GDP growth has not gone above three percent um, since the two thousand and eight crisis. But even before that, um, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad Polly sort of mentioned migrants because um, I've been playing around with um, uh, the World Bank data on GDP per capita. And what you find is not just a, a sort of financial crisis effect, but a, effectively like it, it feels like we're in a kind of Indiana Jones trap where the ceiling is coming down lower and, and, and lower. So, um, you know, average growth per capita in the 1980s was 2.5%, which is kind of um, roughly the same level as... Um, uh, yeah, which is roughly the same level as it, as it was in, in the previous decades. Um, during the 1990s, this falls to 1.9%. In the 2000s, it falls to 1.2%. And in the 2010s, even before we get this massive kind of fall from coronavirus, it falls down to 1.1%. And, you know, if you strip out the recessions from that, and the sort of downturns, essentially what you're seeing is a, 
you know, when Gordon Brown said that he had abolished boom and bust, what it turned out he meant was that he and other politicians appear to have abolished booms. That we, you know, like the, the, you know, the years in which GDP had like a three or a four or even a five in, at the start of it, just kind of slowly start disappearing. So like in 97, Labour inherits a growth rate of about 3.6%. Uh, and it never gets there again, even in the, 2000, in, the, in the years before the 2008 crisis, which we now think of as the good times, GDP is still hovering at about 1.6 to 2.4%. So there are these big structural problems in the economy, which you all identified really well. And I'd agree with, um, you know, obviously I'm head of the CPS, I'd agree with, with Mark on the tax and regulation point. But, you know, um, I mean, Will's, Will's absolutely right about productivity. In, in, Geographical imbalances, skills, all the rest of it, you know, and probably you know, too about participation in the labour market. But the point is, now we are facing this 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 uh, you know immediate short term crisis. To what extent do we prioritise fixing those long term problems, even if it's going to cause us some pain now, or or should we be trying just to get like growth back up to where as quickly as possible to where it was before and then we can start to think about fixing stuff and the other sort of um question i'd ask obviously is um is in terms of the public finances you know government's actions have a you know are going to have a huge um impact on growth at the moment um, in order to support the economy the government is spending you know vastly more money than it is taking in in, in, in tax revenue um the, and the treasury especially is starting to think this is a problem at what point do you think we take off our Keynesian hats on, and or rather, we do the the, the bit of Keynes which no one ever, like, which no one ever remembers, which is that you need to actually balance the books again once you once you've done the, the stimulus spending. At what point do we do that, and 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 when we do do it, is it? Do you, I mean, do you well, do you just let borrowing continue? Do you do a bit of financial repression? Do you uh, cut spending? Do you raise taxes? I mean, what's your kind of um, your personal recipe for that? Um, which hopefully is quite to be going on by, although I see we also have some questions coming as well, but um, I'll throw it to whoever wants to uh, kick off on that. Well, Rob, can I come back with, to you on the immigration point? Because it, this is an, it probably made some interesting points about what GDP doesn't measure, and I agree with that. And uh, I'm, I'm delighted, actually, that so you, you might remember a few years ago, sort of happiness economics became the big thing that we were going to somehow try and you know, work out uh, not how rich you were, but how happy you were. And I can see the rationale behind that, because if, and as I said, I think GDP growth is really important, but if you were to take a kind of reductive ad absurdum approach, you can see obvious ways in which you could increase GDP, but make people fairly miserable. I mean, you could... Yes, the, 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 the classic example is if you pollute a river and then clean it up again, it's wonderful. Yeah. For... Or, or, or ban people from retiring, right? I mean, you say, you know, you're 60 years old, you want to retire, you want to spend the rest of your life on the golf course, you can't. You have to continue to work as an investment banker until you're carried out in a coffin from whichever investment bank you're at. That would improve GDP, but wouldn't necessarily improve happiness. I mean, the problem with that, so there are all sorts of flaws, you know, in the way that we measure GDP. It's not perfect. There's all sorts of flaws in how you measure happiness because i mean i think i'm right in saying whenever you survey the british people we're a pretty phlegmatic bunch we always come out at a seven whatever's actually happened with the prevailing economy so it's not sure it's not obvious that informs public policy the point that i wanted to take issue with uh, was on immigration because you could say that it's obviously not gdp that matters it's gdp per capita that matters uh, i'm not even persuaded of that um because imagine a, a world in which um we tackle full-on Polly's concern about uh, the uh, allocation of cleaning duties in domestic households. And we take this on because virtually every family in Britain hires a full-time domestic cleaner, a butler and a chauffeur from India. Uh, and each of these people are paid, let's say, £15,000 per annum. Well, it seems to me that that would lower GDP per capita because £15,000 is indeed below average GDP per capita. It's obviously, however, improved the earnings of those three Indians per household because they would not be earning uh, £15,000 per capita in, uh, back in India. And it's also presumably uh, improved the lives of the rest of us because uh, we no longer have to drive our cars, clean our houses or make our own dinners. We now have three people doing it for them. So, uh, I, 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 But GDP per capita would fall. So I think that it's very difficult to get an ex a grip totally on the... Uh, what precise statistic are we looking at? And I don't think we should be complete central planners on looking at one 
metric and saying that and that alone is what we're going I, to I, I'm actually saying, I, I am obviously personally very you know quite quite keen on immigration especially high school immigration um, my my mother was a high school was a was a teacher from New Zealand uh, my you know, most of my family have married uh, people from overseas so uh, no I'm sorry I wasn't I wasn't accusing you of racism Rob or anything like that uh, I, I know you're not uh, I'm just saying that you, the, the point that you make is an interesting one because it goes to GDP per capita, but, it, but you might actually imagine a world, the one I've just painted, it will be an extreme example in which GDP per capita falls, but actually the UK is in a better position isn't there, uh, with, with immigration and low, relatively low skilled work coming in. I mean, I think what to aim for, which is why I kept my points to very general and I was interested in what Polly and Will said, but I think most of those things can be achieved or encouraged by uh, market reforms. Uh, yeah, of course, I'd like us to have a better education system. Uh, I don't necessarily think that the solution to that, however, is uh, further directives from the DfE on exactly what mechanical engineering skills a 14 year old boy or girl needs to learn in order that they're better in the manufacturing industry. I think we should take a more meta approach to many of these things. Very interested in what Will said about regional disparities in growth I'd, I'd like to hear more from him about whether that's a problem i mean if i had if i had a plan that i could prove to you over the long run would see london grow at five percent a year and the rest of the uk grow at four percent a year would will want to execute that plan or would he feel that it's fundamentally insecure because london would be pulling away from the rest even though the rest were growing at four percent per annum at what point you get that tilt where i'm undermining long-term growth i mean on, on the face of it i would if, if there was such a plan i could roll out that gave us those numbers i'd pull the trigger right away and i'm not that bothered about the regional unbalances and you know as long as everybody's growing i don't mind if the richer areas are growing faster if you've got a plan to do that so so my approach would be um on all of the things raised what is the best framework that the government can produce to give us the best shots of these things of improving the education system with regard to skills um, of encouraging um, uh, whether it's you know women or older people to enter or remain in the labour market and I remain adamant that those that framework is one in which tax and regulation are presently too high I do take a long-term view on that I'm not um, utterly panicked that this year's budget deficit will be the worst in history that's livable with uh, but it's not livable with over the longer run so I think if we were taking a five or ten year time horizon I would have thought that uh, most sensible people uh, really from across the political spectrum should be able to agree that we are taxing and spending beyond our long term capability. And therefore, we need to have a serious discussion about how we slice up a smaller pie in the public sector and what our priorities are. If it is the NHS, then it can't also be education and defence and the police force. Uh, and that we have a serious discussion about whether how we're going to, again, at a meta level, tackle red tape. And that doesn't just mean you just throw it all on the bonfire, but what process are we going to go through on sunset clauses, on uh, probably measuring the impact? And I think if you get those sort of meta things right, most other things fall into place, which is not to say uh, that you are certain of getting it 100% right, but a good number of the concerns, wholly legitimate concerns raised by Will and Polly, I think are heavily mitigated. Well, Polly, do you want to go next just so we don't just repeat the order uh, from before? Uh, sure. I think um, Mark's just said that people from across the political spectrum think that the state should be smaller. And I, um, I mean, that's probably true about this year, given, as you, as you say, Mark, like this is this is an anomalous year in which we've spent a huge amount. So we've got some work from Demos coming out next week where we've done a lot of exploratory work with the public around the future of the tax system. I don't want to spike my own report because that would be self-defeating, but um, we had to explore with people this fundamental choice that uh, our demographics mean that demand for even status quo public services is rising. Um, because particularly because of the I've, I've said we're not allowed to talk about old people as a problem nevertheless they're it, certainly inactive older people uh, create uh, more of a burden on those who are active in the economy it's one of the reasons why I think more people should be active um, so if you want just standstill quality public services uh, given there's a whole range of ways in which the tax base is falling then we have we have to find a way to tax more or you have to cut back those services and people's expectations um, and 
I think when you explore that with the public, it's it's really quite rare for people to say that what they want is dramatically lower public services. Of course, if you can pull off 5% growth, uh, you get to the point where the economy is growing so fast that lots of those trade-offs are reduced or perhaps even removed altogether. Nevertheless, that's quite a political journey for people to go on. And uh, I, 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 don't, I don't think there is a, at the moment at least, a coherent plan that I've seen that, that sees any of the countries of the West really returning to the levels of growth that they achieved in the 80s or early 90s. But um, so I, I, I think when it comes to fiscal policy, there is extraordinary pressure, but the pressure will be towards spending more. And whether that spending more is sustained by deficits, because we have both the modern monetary theory crowd on the left and the sod it, let's just spend money because that's what the Americans do. I mean, the Americans have like the exorbitant privilege of a deficit that no one seems to give a damn about of, I don't know, 93 trillion or whatever it is. Um, people who are sort of, well, let's be like America. Who cares about this whole like making the books balance? Like sound money has gone massively, massively out of fashion on left and right. So um, I think the pressure will be to spend more whether it's on infrastructure, like Will's talking about, whether it's on uh, leveling up, whether it's on decarbonizing, and then also on those public services, which people demand. People demand the defense spending, they demand the police spending. And we don't have, certainly at the moment, a government with enormous appetite for saying, I'm sorry, it's all too expensive, in the way that austerity, or public service spending cuts, w commanded public support a decade ago, and they simply do not now. So. Um, I mean, that's all just context, really, and I don't want to hog the debate, but I, I just think we have to be really careful about where the political balance lies now. Um, and if we think that the only pathway to growth is much lower taxes and much lower regulations, well, then we're like, I, I don't see a political pathway to that settlement. Personally, I think there are other pathways to growth, but um, we shouldn't claim political hegemony if it's not there. Will, you're nodding uh, vigorously. Yeah, no, I have a lot of sympathy for everything that, that Polly just said. Um, David Willits uh, has a, had a wonderful phrase in one of his books in the 1990s where he said, if, if you want to reduce uh, the supply of public services, then you should first reduce the demand for public services. Um, and the reality is that in most polls, uh, we find certainly, and I think this is replicated by British Social Attitudes and others, that at least two thirds of people uh, are in favor of uh, the government reducing the gap between the rich and poor rather than growing the economy um, and they have uh, a, a strong um, support for uh, investment in public services against uh, kind of deregulation and tax cuts and reducing the size of the state so um, it doesn't seem to me at all that um, people like Mark and others who who make the argument for uh, significant uh, reduction of the size of the state and significant um, uh, tax cuts alongside that have convinced the ordinary voter. Uh, and I think that's the prerequisite for anyone um, claiming that that's a, a viable um, course of action over the next few years. As, as Polly says, um, the, the kind of the argument is actually really going in the other way if you talk to, if you talk to ordinary folk. Um, that said, I think there are things that we can do. Um, I, I personally don't think that we should we certainly need to hold on to the concepts of sound money. We need to ensure that if we are uh, increasing our spending, we are finding ways to pay for it or finding savings elsewhere in the system in order to pay for it. I do, I, I'm not one of these people who thinks that we can, um, we can just uh, increase public spending through through deficit spending and borrowing. That that would be um, entirely uh, inappropriate, and it, would, and it would just be taxes deferred for the next generation. And let's be honest about that. Let's not let's not kid ourselves. Um, but I think there are things that we can do. I mean, I'm a great I'm a great proponent of um, of tax simplification and and regulatory simplification. That doesn't necessarily mean reducing the overall burden, but I think there is a lot that we can do to to improve certainty, stability, and uh, the kind of uh, the kind of long-term context for business and uh, and other investment. Um, I think uh, I think so. You could look at tax reliefs. You could look at 
um, uh, you look, look at different regulations, um, Mark and others, the experts on the complexity of the regulatory system, but um, there are things that we can do within the overall envelope as it stands, uh, and we should do those things. Um, and then the thing that I'm, I mentioned briefly when I was talking before, but I really think could, could be the most important thing we could do is to improve the governance of the United Kingdom. I mean, our, our, um, our markets and our um, our labour markets, and uh, if you look at the kind of regional economy, we have incredibly weak, patchy, um, uh, and often um, pretty uh, pretty kind of uh, imbalanced governance. Uh, we have some cities like London uh, and increasingly Manchester who have uh, largely self-contained uh, economic leadership and, and governance. We have other places which have almost entirely absent economic leadership and governance. Um, that patchwork quilt is a massive. Uh, kind of hamper on growth that holds growth back um, and it makes business decision making increasingly complex and, and difficult so so I think and that's not necessarily about increasing spending or reducing spending that's spending the money that we do spend better and thinking about the structures which uh, which uh, kind of uh, kind of exercise that spending and they're held accountable for those decisions and I'll just chip in. I mean, I mean that's the the thesis of um, Adrian Woolridge and um, uh, John Middlethwaite's new book, um, which uh, uh, the, you know it is 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 essentially that the the dividing line in COVID is not between big state and small state countries. It's between those which actually have governments that work and governments that don't. And Britain is kind of has been sort of fairly exposed on on that front. I mean, I mean, obviously, I would sort of lean towards Mark's point on tax and deregulation. I think there's, there's a sort of, there is a sort of trap here that, you know, the more, the more, the lower growth becomes, the more politics has become about cake sharing rather than cake growing. And then you sort of, you, you, you end up in a sort of self-fulfilling situation where, you know, you know, if, I, I sort of, I, I sort of felt, you know, Corbynism was almost the sort of the incarnation of this. That you, know, if you've all convinced yourself that growth isn't going to come back, then it makes perfect sense for politics to be defined by getting pissed off about how much rich people have, because mm. the idea that you can become rich yourself has kind of has sort of drained away from from public discourse. And that brings me onto one of the one of the questions we've had, which is, um, you know, the, the talking about this decline I, I've mentioned. Um, this is kind of long-term thing, dwindling in GDP. I mean, what, what's your kind of take on why that's happened? I mean, obviously, as Polly mentioned, there is a kind of similar pattern in many of the developed countries, but I think it's fair to say ours is, ours is, um, is uh, our, our GDP has been more sluggish. You know, is, this, is this one big thing, e.g. productivity, or is it just, as, is it Marx pebble theory again, just a lot of little things mounting up to, um, to choke off um, the animal spirits of the economy? I don't know who, want, who wanted to go first, um, Robert. But I'm I'm happy to jump in. Um, uh, so just just on your point about Adrian Waldridge and um, uh, and his new book, uh, Philip McCann from Sheffield University is the is the real guru on this and on the kind of governance problem in the UK. And I'd highly recommend his his book, The UK's National Regional Economic Problem, um, to your audience. Um, so on the on the causes, I mean, I, there's obviously intense debate about this um, uh, amongst uh, economists, and uh, and new data seems to come to light, which shows a, a, a kind of different set of explanations almost on a on a monthly basis. Um, uh, I think, to my mind, um, some of the things that I mentioned earlier are probably most at fault, not least because they all seem to be going in the wrong direction. If you look at skills, if you look at um, uh, fixed investment in the economy, and if you look at uh, a kind of regional uh, regional balance and regional governance, all of those things are becoming uh, less conducive to growth and, and productivity uh, growth over the long term. Um, and certainly over the last 40 years or so have, have um, worsened. So uh, so I, for me, it is the structural conditions, the kind of foundations of the economy that we have let wither. Um, now, some of that is a lack of public investment. Some of that bluntly is a, uh, a kind of failure to create the conditions for the private sector to invest. And um, I'm certainly not saying the, the solution is only public sector led activity. It must be uh, both. But ultimately, government sets the, the rule book, government sets the, the terms of the game. And uh, if the government hasn't been paying attention to those things over a long period, then those two, those things have uh, deteriorated in kind. And I think that those are the, those are the core um, kind of problems I foresee. Mark, Polly? Can I come in? The, uh, I mean, I, I think I agree with Will on that. I certainly also agree about the governmental structure being uh, particularly bad in the UK. Uh, we have a highly, highly centralised state and the extent to which we have decentralised decision making is 
hugely asymmetric and complex uh, and a good amount of that decentralization uh, is not in my view sufficiently serious the powers that we have removed from Westminster and given to regions or councils or assemblies or parliaments is not great enough I'd much prefer a, a much more federal structure but to your point Rob about what's going wrong uh, again I think I'm sort of with Will I mean if, if you were to look at sort of 10 dials each of which affect whether you're going to get economic growth uh, I think if you like nearly all of those dials have turned somewhat in a bad direction they're not all turning in a disastrous direction I mean I can quote that the you know the, the the tax take this year is the highest for 50 years not by a massive amount and it might be at the end well, of the I, I don't think the tax take it, it was the highest for, for, for you know um. well as a proportion of gdp it might even still be yet higher just because gdp's gone back <laughs> percent right and it might be that tax takes go down 19 percent your tax take as a proportion of gdp is higher so but not massively so i'm not i'm not trying to be hysterical here it's just by a dial you know, regulation has got worse by probably a few notches. Uh, I agree our education and skills system has been found wanting. Uh, our, the fiscal position of the UK has deteriorated. Our overall national debt is worsening. Our long-term liabilities are worsening. None of these of themselves sort of push you over the edge of the cliff. I'm not, I'm not predicting an apocalypse. But if you like, each of the dials that you might think are those that would tend to lean towards improved economic growth or worsening economic growth, all of those dials, one way or another, are just being slowly, gradually dialed to worse. And if all of the dials are slowly, gradually being turned to worse, the compound effect of that is pretty serious. Uh, I think that the, I mean, I'm, I'm with Albert Einstein on this, that the eighth wonder of the world is uh, compound interest. Uh, those who understand it uh, gain from it, but those who don't understand it pay it. And if we are going to be short term, and I was interested what Will and Polly were saying about the polling, of the public, not just my observations about the views of the political class. If we are uh, a country who by and large the, uh, believes that what matters is how much we spend on public services this year or next, not the compound uh, interest, the compound mass of economic growth over a generation, we've got a problem. We will be the people who suffer from the eighth wonder of the world compound mass. And as I say, I just, I, 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 at the top of the show, I. Uh, rattled out my numbers about why growth is important if you were to look at average earnings. I just uh, looked at that again on let's assume that you want to spend per person in Britain in the public sector £12,000 per annum. Um, if you get that low growth rate of 1%, uh, then in 20 years time the prevailing overall tax rate will have to be about 40% in order to spend that amount. You could actually spend a little more uh, it, with a prevailing tax rate of nearly 23%, uh, practically half, if you were able to find a mix of policies that gave you a 4% long-term growth rate rather than a 1% long-term growth rate. Now, that's precious little consolation for someone who wants an NH operation now or wants you know, an improved um, teaching for their kids now, not in 20 years' time, or, or wants uh, better armed forces now rather than investment over 20 years. But to my mind, it shows the battle that people, Rob, on your and my side of the ledger, who, who think that tax and regulation are important issues and are going in the wrong direction, we've got to win the compound math question. Because over 20 years, this has a colossal, colossal difference. And if we can't persuade the public of that, and Wills and Polly's polling seems to indicate that we haven't, uh, then I'm afraid we are going to be stuck in uh, the question of how to slice up a relatively small and shriveled pie rather than how to uh, cook more efficiently a bigger pie. Well, Polly, you, you, you alluded in, in, uh, earlier to, to there being alternative models of growth and alternative ways in which, you know, it's not just about uh, cutting taxes and regulation and unleashing the private sector. Is it about Dominic Cummings creating his own gigantic new tech companies? Or, you know, what, what, are, what are the alternative options? So, I think if we look at um, of, of period of high growth, there's, there's two things going on. One is, right, and so when I was little, if the, we had a really rubbish hot water system. And so quite, quite often my mum would run a bath and it wasn't really warm enough. So she would get like a kettle full of boiling water and pour that in. And obviously it, it spread out, that just took it up, that took the temperature of the bath up, right? Like I promise this is a useful metaphor. So the, there's lots of kind of structural, complicated, pebble-sized things that are pebbles, heat, you know what I mean, that are slowly warming up your bath of growth, 
we, and we, then, we, we seem to be gravitating towards aquatic slash thermodynamics. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there have been these things which we could kind of pour in. And I've mentioned a couple of them, which is this huge transfer over a generation of women into the paid labour market. Um, and then you've got the raising of the, the retirement age and the massive reduction in the number of people who are leaving the labour pit in old age. And then you've got other things like North Sea oil um, or the Big Bang and, you know, the, the removal of, you know, huge chunks of stultifying financial markets regulation, which meant that nobody could really get a, 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 a decent mortgage. Um, and that then liberated a whole bunch of, of house buying. Or then you have right to buy, which, of course, converted state spending from the 30s, 40s, 50s and 60s into basically cash now for people. And, and the, well, these, I sort of think of them as kettles of water being put in. And Dom, uh, I understand, I, like, you know, he, he wrote on his blog once, um, this metaphor, which is usually used about immigration, that there are literal trillion dollar bills in the street just waiting to be picked up. And that trillion dollar bill to me is a bit like the kettle. It's the thing that's over and above your let's be sensible and, and, and increase the marginal thing. There's just some big like extra thing we get to chuck in. And, 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 and if it's inventing a Google, it's, it's something like that. But, but there are other, it's, it's why I think there's still a lot to be gained from the lot, you know, getting women up to the same labor market participation as men or shifting the way we deal with older people. Or I would have migrants. I think that we need to think about what are the big chunky kettles of hot water that can help lift um, the sensible, reasonable kind of marginal stuff. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the depressing alternative to that to it is to just think that, you know, we've reached the top and we've had to stop, uh, you know, that the, the, the bath, the, the, the plumbing is now as fixed as it can be. Yeah, but that's not true, is it? Because there are other countries with higher GDP per capita than us, right? And, and I mean, I, I don't think I would want to live in America for a whole bunch of reasons, but, you know, there are, there are other, like, I don't know, Luxembourg's a weird anomaly. They, you know, they, I don't think we should just say, oh, there is no more growth, there's no more productivity. There are. There are kettles out there. We just need to put them to boil. I think the problem, the problem with this is, in. Can, I, can I stretch this analogy to breaking point? Yes. I mean, my, 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 my worry here is that unlike um, Polly's uh, highly diligent and intelligent and sensible mother, the state has a tendency to unnecessarily boil the kettle three times, spill most of the water on the way to its bar on the bathroom, and then pour it over the child's head and scold the child while they sit in an otherwise cold bath. So the, the question to my mind is if all these kettles are sitting around and can be efficiently deployed, is the state or the private sector the better way to deploy them? And I think I would trust Polly's mother considerably more than I would trust the state to engage in that sort of uh, heating up the economy activity. Mark, you have not met my mother. She <laughs> she ran a loss making business and was propped up on income support for a good decade. Well, at Definitely. least in this instant of bath heating, I think. She, on the bath she, she heating, the well. crow. I mean, Will, do you, have, do you have any more aquatic metaphors to throw in, or should I just go to the last question? I did go to the last question. I can't. I can't better Mark's um, uh, wonderful analogy. <laughs> so two minute. Just had a two minute warning. Uh, so one final question, which it's sort of can can, can be um, uh, part of your concluding remarks. Um, just uh, a very simple question from, from one of our viewers. What one thing would you change? What's the one thing that, um, that would get, get the economy uh, moving in your view? Um, my view on this, as it always has been, is build a load more houses. I'm with you, Rob. Like, houses, houses. The planning system sucks. Uh, I'm not sure that's uh, well. That would be one regulation that you could repeal, and I would agree with Polly and Rob on that. I don't. I I have to say I don't think there is a silver bullet. Uh, I think there are lots of bronze bullets to fire. Um, some might be closer to silver than others. I think it's that the that the government uh, needs to have a strategy around growth, and I don't think it has one. It has strategies for uh, everything else, from obesity to beating COVID-19 and God knows what else, but when it actually comes to uh, how do you want to see the economy grow and do we prioritise that, I actually think getting that to the top of the agenda and the list, and then all of these are baubles on that tree, whether it's then planning reform or deregulation of the financial sector or lowering the tax burden in certain areas, that follows from it, but it's actually a matter of political will, and uh, the best thing would be for us to encourage politicians and those with the ability to actually change public policy to put 
economic growth basically at the top of the list of priorities and to have a plan that stretches not over two or three weeks, but over a generation or more. Will, final words? Well, I, so I have a lot of um, sympathy for what Mark just said about there being lots of bronze bullets rather than a single uh, silver one. But um, I do, the thing that I would say um, is that I think for us, to, for us to return to a strong growth-led model, we need to return legitimacy to growth. And, and I think one of the big problems over the last decade is that uh, not necessarily, I mean, we obviously haven't had particularly strong growth, but um, the growth that we have had has been perceived to be uh, lopsided. Um, so uh, this is one of the reasons why I'm a great proponent and supporter of the government's efforts on levelling up, because I think uh, bringing opportunity and prosperity to parts of the country and people, groups of people who have missed out on it or been left behind as it were um, is fundamental to regaining some of that economic legitimacy um, for for the voters who bluntly are the most volatile and most important for winning elections um, so uh, so the most important thing that we can do for growth as a whole is to make growth popular again um, uh, and i think leveling up is the way in which to do that well that is not only the sub making growth popular again is not only the, is the subject of a lecture I'm giving in about a week and a half's time, if I ever finish writing it, um, but making growth, uh, spreading growth to all is the topic of our final se session uh, in 10 minutes time. So thank you, Will, for the perfect segue. Um, thank you all very much for, for joining us. Please do join Guy Opperman, Richard Holden, Gerard Lyons, Helen Barnard and myself rather than Nick King, who's been uh, fallen victim to the quarantine rules, um, for our final and, uh, and equally wonderful session on um, securing an economic recovery for all. Just thank you again to my panellists and thank you all for watching. Thank you. Thanks.